Hey guys and welcome back to my channel for this month's Serial Killer Spotlight video where today I'm going to be focusing on a lesser known killer, Stephen Port or more often known by the attention grabbing moniker, the Grinder Killer. This story is particularly frustrating because Stephen Port could have been stopped way before he ever became a serial killer. Had the Barking and Dagenham police done their job properly, they could have put an end to his crimes. But ignorance around the gay community and just a failure to follow proper protocol had serious and deadly consequences. Had Stephen Port targeted young women or even maybe straight men in a more affluent area of London, it's doubtful they ever would have committed more than just a single murder. I'm a glass half full kind of person, I like to look on the bright side of things, but there's just no tiptoeing around this case being a really sad tale of failures and inadequacy within the police. The UK police countrywide still have a long way to go in dealing with victims of crime within the LGBTQ plus community and of course other marginalised groups. If you're an avid watcher of my Serial Killer Spotlight videos, you'll know that I usually like to start with the killer's childhood and work my way through chronologically. But with Stephen Port being a lesser known and a more recent killer, there isn't exactly a wealth of information about him and his upbringing online. What we do know is that he was born on the 22nd of February 1975 in Southend-on-Sea in Essex in the UK. When he was one years old, he moved with his family to Dagenham in East London, which is where he would grow up. By serial killer standards, he would have quite a normal life. No abuse of any kind as far as we know, but he was bullied at school, described as a bit of a loner, as they all are. But in fact, he was so quiet that a lot of people at school thought he was actually deaf. He just seemed very unwilling to communicate with others, he struggled to make eye contact, and was known for giving just one or two word answers. He got his GCSEs and ended up going to art college. He had the skills, but ended up having to drop out because his family simply couldn't afford the fees. Instead, he does a YTS course on catering and ends up getting a job as a chef, a profession he would continue in until he was captured. At the time of his crimes, he was working as a chef at a stagecoach bus depot in West Ham. His family say that he came out to them as gay at the age of 26, something his mother struggled with as she wanted to have grandchildren. But he was never shy about bringing his boyfriends around, who changed often but were very similar for the most part. They were all in their early 20s, younger than they looked, slim build, twink types. A quick definition of twink is a gay man with attractive boyish qualities, young, slender, of smaller build, little to no body hair. Stephen lived with his parents at Dagenham until he was 30 years old before moving out to Cook Street in nearby Barking, where he part owned and part rented a small flat. People who know him describe him as childlike. Stephen loved toys. Not only did he collect them, but he actively played with them, getting lost in his imagination akin to a five-year-old. People generally found him to be a bit odd, but nice enough. He was awkward and shy, but then again, on a lot of us. He just struggled to connect with people in real life, and whilst according to some he enjoyed London nightlife, he found it easier to connect over the internet. He had multiple accounts across multiple social media sites, on which he would embellish the truth about himself, make himself seem better than he was, something which a lot of people are guilty of doing on social media. Only we're not talking little white lies or exaggerated stories here. He had in his Facebook profile that he was a graduate of Oxford University, he was ex-military, that he worked as a special needs teacher and he would often use photos of his younger self. All of which are lies. This is concerning when he's meeting most of his conquests, his boyfriends, online, feeding them a lie about who he is. When people got to know Stephen Port over the internet, they weren't getting to know Stephen Port at all. Perhaps he lied because he felt inferior to others, because he wanted to escape online from his real life, or perhaps he lied because he knew it would make him more desirable. I mean, Stephen Port wasn't exactly the best looking person you'd ever meet in your life, and combined with his incredibly poor social skills, he would have struggled to meet anyone in real life at face value. His friends say how a man never stuck around with Stephen for long. He was meeting new people online almost every single day. There's no denying that he was attracted to younger looking men, never really going for anyone over the age of 25, even though he was coming to the end of his 30s by this point. The men he dated spoke of how he was mentally abusive, controlling and manipulative. Friends speculate that the reason he went for the type of male he did was because he perceived them as easy to control. Stephen enjoyed having power. As time goes on, Stephen Port would get involved in a world of drug fueled sex parties. One neighbour talks of coming into his house and finding his entire coffee table covered in bags of cocaine and bottles of GHB. 
As Stephen becomes more involved in this world, he withdrew from a few friends he did have, and therefore there was no one to hold him accountable for his actions. If anybody had looked at his internet history, they would have found numerous searches pertaining to drunk boy rape. As time went on, his searches became more and more perverse. He just couldn't find what he needed to satisfy himself. What he needed, he needed to get from real life encounters. Anthony Walgate was sadly going to be the one to pay for Stephen Port's darkness. He was 23 years old, originally from Hull, but had come down to London to study fashion. He was determined to become a famous fashion designer one day, and with his ambition, he would have done whatever it took. Anthony's mother says she has no doubts that he would have achieved his dreams, but he wasn't that good at money management and so resorted occasionally to working as a gay escort. Anthony wasn't stupid though and took all the right precautions. He always obtained his client's dress in advance and a photograph of them, which he would send to friends so they always knew where he was and who he was with. And just to premeditate some of the comments I will undoubtedly get in regards to this, sex work isn't inherently bad. As long as it's between two consenting adults, there's no reason to judge people for their choices. Anthony was just one of the unlucky ones when he came across Stephen Port, a man who had little regard for human life. He did everything he usually did that night. He told his friends where he was going. He made sure they had an address. He agreed with Stephen Port a payment of £800 for an overnight session and the two met at Barking Station just after 10.15pm on the 17th of June 2014. It later transpired that Stephen did not have £800 in savings or in general. He likely never had any intention of paying, which means that what he did may have been very much premeditated. After Anthony met Stephen, his phone was never used again. Two days later, 999 received a call from a man reporting that he'd just returned home from work and had found a man collapsed outside his flats. That it looked like he'd had a seizure or something. Paramedics arrived and found Anthony's body slumped up against a wall, a bottle of GHB in his pocket. GHB is a drug that's most often sold as a colourless liquid. It smells of very little and has a salty or soapy taste, which can be covered with other strong flavours. It's a strong drug and very easy to overdose on, which can lead to unconsciousness, coma and death, as you will come to see in this video. Because GHB makes people pass out pretty easily, it's often used as a date rape drug, but if used correctly, it has similar effects to alcohol and can make you feel euphoric, drowsy, relaxed and turned on. Most people use it to have more intense sex, which is what makes it quite a popular drug within the gay community. Anthony being found with a bottle of GHB in his pocket and the subsequent post-mortem showing that he had died because he had a large amount of GHB in his system made this a pretty open and shut case. He had died of a drug overdose. But the pathologist wasn't able to say a precise time at which he died and there wasn't a mark on him. The death was not treated as suspicious. It turns out the man who reported Anthony outside his flats was none other than Stephen Port himself. He told police how he'd returned home from work about 4am to come upon Anthony by chance. He never said anything about knowing him. But then Anthony's friends contact the police and tell them that Anthony had been working as an escort, that he'd gone to meet a man and the police soon realised that the address his friends provided was the very same as the man who'd reported his body. On the 26th of June, Stephen Port was arrested, his phone and laptop seized and his DNA taken. He's questioned and this time he tells a different version of events. He said that Anthony had taken drugs whilst they were together that night and that he fell asleep. Stephen leaves him in his flat as he heads to work and when he returns home, he finds him dead. He panicked and carried the body outside and called the police. He said that he was scared of getting in trouble, that they might suspect him of murdering Anthony. He acted in the heat of the moment, he said, and the police believed him. He was simply charged with perverting the course of justice and was immediately released on bail, given a court date of March 2015. There was no further investigation, the police didn't even look at his laptop or phone. If they'd bothered and looked at his search history, there's a chance that his crimes could have ended there. They would have found concerning search after concerning search alluding to drugs, overdoses and rape. In reality, what happened is that Stephen Port likely deliberately administered an overdose of GHB to Anthony Walgate with the intention of raping him whilst he was unconscious. Something the judge later said he had no doubt he did. Whether he intended to kill Anthony or not is up for debate. Chances are it may have been an accident, but from that point onwards, Stephen realised that it was an easy way to rape and eliminate the chances of getting caught. Perhaps after it was so easy for him to get away with his first murder with literally zero suspicion on him, he got cocky. He thought he was invincible. 
and so Stephen Port continues with his life. It wasn't long until he set his sights on the next victim. Gabriel Kovari was a 22 year old Slovakian living in London. In the summer of 2014, he'd been living with his friend John Pape for six weeks, for one day he suddenly announced he was moving out the very next day. He moved out on the 23rd of August 2014, and less than a week later, John was informed that Gabriel would be found dead in a local cemetery, a St Margaret's Church in Barking. As you can probably guess, Gabriel moved into Stephen Port's flat. The two had met online and Stephen offered him free rent. As someone living in London, it's very hard to turn down free rent when it's offered. Gabriel would later tell friends that Stephen was kind of different and they slept on the sofa because he didn't want to sleep in the bed with him. Stephen told neighbours about his new Slovakian twink flatmate. He enjoyed having a good looking young man in his flat. He was actually particularly close to one neighbour called Ryan who was another gay man living in the flats and he would often go and visit Ryan with his latest boyfriends. Ryan said that Gabriel struck him as different from the rest, different from Stephen's usual target. He was fast, switched on and ambitious. Gabriel and Ryan hit it off and they exchanged details. They began to message for a few days until Gabriel abruptly stopped replying. Ryan messaged Stephen to ask where Gabriel had gone if he was alright and Stephen simply replied that he had gone. Then a few days later changed tact and said that Gabriel had started to date an army guy and had gone with him and then changed story entirely and said that he'd had some sad news that Gabriel had returned home to Slovakia and on his return had picked up a mysterious illness and suddenly died. Of course none of this was true apart from the Gabriel being dead part. The last text sent from Gabriel's phone was at 5am on the 25th of August. The judge later concluded that shortly after this time, Stephen had administered a fatal dose of GHB to him. It was the next afternoon that Stephen suddenly changed his own mobile number, I'm sure in an attempt to cover up the text that had been sent between them. He then starts telling Ryan all the strange stories about Gabriel's disappearance. Also around this time, Stephen's sister rang him to find him incredibly distressed. He told her that there was a body in his flat. She told him to go to the police. Although Stephen later tried to argue and say that he was talking in the past tense, referring to Anthony Woolgate, the timeline matches up perfectly to him talking about Gabriel Cavari. It seems that Gabriel's body must have remained in the flat for many days after his death, because it was on the 28th of August he was found by a dog walker. His body propped up against the wall of the graveyard at St Margaret's Church. Stephen never said how he moved the body undetected to the graveyard because he's always insisted that he isn't guilty, but it wouldn't have been an easy feat I'm sure once rigor mortis had set in. Once again he planted a bottle of GHB on the body and disposed of the mobile phone, the same as he'd done with Anthony months beforehand. Once the body was found and the police were called, Gabriel was found to have died of a drug overdose, fatal levels of GHB in his system. Once again, the police found the death to not be suspicious, a simple self-administered drug overdose. But one man who refused to believe this was Gabriel's former flatmate, John Pape. He said that the whole situation struck him as very un-Gabriel and he begins to do his own investigation into the death, seeing as the police weren't interested. He goes on to Google and does a simple search looking for other similar deaths in the area, coming across the death of Anthony Walgate just months earlier. Anthony being found on Cook Street, literally around the corner from St Margaret's. What are the chances of two young gay men being found dead of GHB overdoses in such a short space of time so close to one another? John was told of Gabriel's death soon after the body was found. The police turned up at his door. And so John waited for the outpouring of love on Gabriel's Facebook page, but there was none. It seems that the police waited for quite a while before telling his family. John contacted Gabriel's ex Thierry, who he lived in Spain with for a period of time, and the two began talking about the weird circumstances around the death. Things didn't add up. And it wasn't long until things just got weirder. 23 year old Daniel Whitworth was an ambitious chef, doing really well in his chosen career. He was gay, and as so many people do, he turned to the internet to find someone. He used a website called FitLads, the UK's largest gay forum where you can connect and meet with other gay and bisexual men. It was through FitLads that Daniel meets Stephen Port. They messaged for a while before agreeing to meet on the afternoon of the 18th September. Daniel left work early and texted his flatmate to let him know that he would be back late. Through this, you can tell that he had every intention of returning home that same night. 
We don't know exactly what went on that night. All we know for sure is that Daniel died and at 10.30 a.m. the next morning, Stephen deleted his FitLads account. We can only assume because by this point, Daniel was dead and he was trying to delete anything that could link them together. Only of course, there's never really any deleting from the internet. That night, he carried Daniel's body to St. Margaret's Churchyard once again. We placed the body in exactly the same position that he'd placed Gabriel's just a few weeks earlier. Again, Stephen takes and destroys Daniel's mobile phone and plants a small bottle of GHB. He was found the next morning by the very same dog walker who had found Gabriel just a few weeks earlier, sitting on top of a blue bedsheet. The clothes on the top half of his body had been pulled up like he'd been dragged into that position. The cause of Daniel's death was found to be GHB toxicity, but this time Stephen had gone a little bit further and he'd written a suicide note purported to be written by Daniel. In the note pretending to be Daniel, it's explained that he'd deliberately taken a drug overdose to kill himself because he was the one who'd been responsible for Gabriel's death. It's said that he'd been the one to accidentally administer the fatal overdose to Gabriel and couldn't live with himself anymore. And the police saw no reason not to believe this. They saw nothing suspicious here. This is despite the fact the note made no mention of Daniel's family. In fact, it just made references like, don't blame the guy I was with last night, it was only sex. Not suspicious at all, nope. The coroner asked the detective if they'd run the note by Daniel's family, checked if it was his handwriting. The detective said yes, but they hadn't. The coroner eventually concluded that she couldn't be sure that Daniel had been the one to kill Gabriel and then himself. She couldn't rule out the possibility of a third person being involved and so she recorded an open verdict. Nobody could prove for sure that they even knew each other in real life. And the pathologist noted that there was bruising below both arms in the armpit region, which is unlikely to have been caused accidentally and may have resulted from manual handling of the deceased, most likely prior to death. Despite this, there was no further investigation. Just gay men taking drugs and dying as they do. The police didn't look into Daniel's movements in the hours before his death, nor did they even try to look for the man he was apparently with last night as he wrote in the note. They didn't test the blue bedsheet that he was lying on for DNA. Had they done so, it would have led straight to Stephen Port, whose DNA they already had on their database. At this time, John Pape was talking online to Gabriel's ex-boyfriend, Thierry Amodio. Thierry lived in Spain and he said that he'd been talking to somebody online who claimed to know both Daniel and Gabriel, a man called John Luck. He said that he'd contacted John after noticing that he followed Gabriel on Facebook, so wrote to ask if they knew each other. John Luck described himself as a 21-year-old former gay porn star from California. John said that he'd spent two nights with Gabriel around the 22nd of August and that he'd been collected from his home by an older Irish man called Tony. A few days later, John messaged Thierry, letting him know that he'd found Tony. His message read, I texted him and asked him what happened to Gabe, and he said he left with a young guy about his age named Dan, and that they were heading to a party or orgy in Barking. Dan is tall, light brown hair, he said. Looks similar to Gabe, just a bit taller, very slim. When I told him Gabe is dead, he said he didn't want anything to do with it, to leave him alone. Thierry tells John that Dan had also died in relation to Gabriel's death. And John replies, please don't let them arrest me. And then later on says, maybe Dan knew what happened to Gabe and could not live with the guilt or something like that. Weirdly, exactly like the suicide note said. Circles are small in the gay community. Everyone knows everyone. So Thierry had no reason to question this person who said that he knew someone who knew both Gabriel and Daniel. John speaks of how older men would go to these parties to prey on younger men, that they would ply them with alcohol and drugs, slipping them into their drinks and then rape them. It would later transpire that of course, John was Stephen Port and whilst Tony did exist, he'd never met Port or any of the dead men. He was just a name on Facebook that Stephen Port had come across. Port was just drip feeding Thierry a full story in order to lead the narrative in a different direction. John Pape, alarmed by the news that he was hearing through Thierry, decides to contact the Barking and Dagenham police with what he knows, but hits brick wall after brick wall. As he wasn't family, John Pape wasn't able to get any information about Gabriel's case, nor were the police willing to look at the information that he was providing. So he contacts Pink News, one of the world's biggest LGBT media platforms, and Gallup, the UK's only specialist LGBT anti-violence charity who work closely with the police. John Pape asked both to contact the police themselves to push for answers, which they did only to be told that the deaths were being treated as not suspicious. 
Based on this, Pink News decided not to run any story. But at this point, Stephen Port is feeling indestructible. That's three deaths at his hands and the police have barely looked in his direction. He's getting away with his crimes and he's not even trying that hard. On the 23rd of March 2015, he finally had his court date for perverting the cause of justice in relation to the death of Anthony Woolgate. He pleads guilty and is sentenced to eight months in prison, serving only two. He's released on the 4th of June that very same year. And just over three months later, he commits his final murder. 25-year-old Jack Taylor lived in Dagenham with his parents and worked as a forklift truck driver. Jack wasn't openly gay, he wasn't out, but there's evidence to suggest that he had access to gay dating websites before. On the night he met Stephen Port, Jack had been out drinking at a local club before going home and logging onto Grindr, which is described online as a social networking and online dating app for gay, bisexual, trans and queer people. It's basically Tinder, but for gay men. After briefly talking to Stephen, Jack agreed to meet him at Barking train station, which he did at 3.15am on the 13th September. They head back together to Stephen's flat. Once again, exactly what happened inside the flat, we'll never know. The only person who knows is Stephen. But just before 7.30am that morning, just four hours after the pair met, Stephen blocked Jack's account on Grindr, therefore deleting the messages between them, and then later that morning deleted the account entirely. It can be assumed that by this point, Jack was already dead. At the time, Stephen had a flatmate who he sent a string of texts to telling him not to return home that day. We could assume because he had a dead body in there. It must have remained in the flat all day until he took it to the churchyard later that night and positioned it sitting against the wall, just over the wall from where both Gabriel and Daniel had been found previously. Once again, Stephen disposed of Jack's mobile phone and planted a bottle of GHB. This time he goes the extra mile though and also plants a tourniquet and some medical wipes to add further credence to the drug storyline that he'd created here. Jack's body was found the next day and toxicology reports showed GHB in his system at fatal levels. The pathologist put his death down as a mixed drug and alcohol overdose as Jack had been drinking earlier in the night and the mixture of GHB and alcohol can often have a cumulative effect. Once again, the police saw nothing suspicious in this death. That's four bodies within just a couple of months, three of them found in pretty much exactly the same position, but nope, still not suspicious, just gay men being gay. Stigma lent a huge hand as to how this case was handled. But Jack's family were immediately suspicious of the death. For one thing, Jack was incredibly vocal about the fact that he didn't do drugs, he didn't like them. For him to die of a drug overdose was completely unbelievable. He also wouldn't have been in the dark graveyard in the middle of the night. Just nothing about the situation was very Jack. Just everything about the situation seemed off to them and so they fought the police, who actually didn't contact them again for nearly two weeks after they received the news that Jack had died. His family went through all of Jack's movements that weekend. They go on the internet and find the other men who had died under similar circumstances in the area. They go through each of the men's backgrounds and found similarities between the cases and compared them to Jack's. They took all of this information to the police who simply weren't interested. Eventually they found out the police had CCTV footage of Jack meeting a man outside Barking Station just hours before his death. His family asked for the footage to be released to the public to see if anybody knew this man and eventually the police relented. On the 13th of October 2015, the Met issued an image of Jack walking with a tall blonde man. But it wasn't a random member of the public who identified this tall blonde man as Stephen Port. It was actually a barking Dagenham police officer who realised who this man was. And so, on the morning of the 15th of October 2015, Stephen Port was arrested at his flat on suspicion of causing the deaths of Anthony Woolgate, Gabriel Kabari, Daniel Whitworth and Jack Taylor. And his case was passed the Met's main homicide and major crime command. He was questioned extensively over the next four days, in which time he doubled down his story about Anthony Woolgate's death and denied knowing the rest of the men. But he might have met Daniel Whitworth briefly at a sex party in London and slightly kissed him. Stephen claimed that he'd never used GHB, he'd never bought it and had never given it to anyone else. A straight up lie because as we know, neighbours had seen bottles all over his coffee table. It didn't take more than a rudimentary look for police to link Stephen Port to all four cases and on the 18th of October 2015 he was charged with four counts of murder. The media covered this case in detail and this brought forward eight more men who described being drugged, raped and sexually assaulted at Stephen's flat after meeting him online or they knew him previously. All of their accounts were very very similar. 
Stephen would either spike their drinks with GHB or manually insert it into their anuses with a syringe under the guise of applying lubricant. The men would feel the effects of this almost instantly and would lose consciousness. I think this is an important point to remember. These were men who were willing for the most part to have sex with Stephen Port. They'd met on Grindr with the intention of having sex. But he didn't want normal sex. He wanted them to be unconscious. He wanted to violate and rape them. These men did not consent to the administration of the drugs, nor did they consent to being penetrated whilst unconscious. In total, Stephen Port was charged with four counts of murder, four alternative counts of manslaughter, four counts of administering a poison with intent to endanger life or inflict grievous bodily harm, seven counts of rape, six counts of administering a substance with intent to overpower to allow sexual activity, and four counts of sexual assault by penetration. The trial began at the Old Bailey in London on the 5th of October 2016 and he pled not guilty to everything. The trial was pretty damning for Port. A handwriting expert confirmed that the writing on the suicide note was not a match to Daniel's, but it was a match to Port's. The paper it had been written on and the plastic sleeve it had been placed in were both found to be from Port's flat. Testing on several items that were found with the bodies of Gabriel, Daniel and Jack were found to be covered in the DNA of Stephen, including Daniel's clothes, Gabriel's sunglasses and that blue sheet that Daniel was found sitting on top of. In fact, the sheet was proven to be from Stephen's own bed. Investigators showed how they're able to trace the IP address of the John Luck account back to two of Port's laptops. They found his concerning internet search history and they found 83 homemade sex videos on his mobile, some of the clips showing him having sex with unconscious men. It also turned out that the blonde hair that he was known for was actually toupee that he'd been wearing for about a decade. Everything about the man that Stephen presented himself online as was fake. At the time of his trial, he was 41 years old. In court, he would never look at the families of his victims. He was mumbly and evasive, never answering questions properly. As he tried to explain away his links to each victim, he just dug himself in deeper and deeper holes. Eventually, he admitted to writing the suicide note, but claimed that Daniel dictated it to him. He was just a compulsive liar. DCI Tim Duffield, the man in charge of the successful investigation, said to the BBC, He's a voracious sexual predator who appears to be fixated, nay obsessed, with surreptitiously drugging young, often vulnerable men of the exclusive purpose of rape. This is a highly devious, manipulative and self-obsessed individual. Stephen Port has never shown any remorse. On the 25th of November 2016, he was found guilty on 22 offences and was eventually sentenced to life in prison. He is now incarcerated at Belmarsh Prison, where he will likely die. So yeah, justice was served in the end, but it should have been served much, much earlier. He never should have had a chance to kill his last three victims had the police done their job properly after the body of Anthony was discovered. There seemed to be a lack of empathy in this case. The police in charge didn't seem to be too worried about ensuring there was no foul play and that everything was taken at face value. There was failure after failure here. The public did more to help in this case than the police did. Even when the coroner at the inquest into Daniel Whitworth's death raised questions as she wasn't convinced it was suicide, nobody did anything. The Independent Police Complaints Commission opened an investigation after the Metropolitan Police made a voluntary referral, looking into whether 17 police officers should face disciplinary action for their lack of action in regards to this case. Seven of them faced losing their jobs if they were found guilty of gross misconduct. And the High Court quashed the original inquest into the deaths of Daniel and Gabriel, paving the way for inquests into the death of all four victims to be held together. In 2019, it was announced that none of the 17 officers would face disciplinary action, but the Independent Office of Police Conduct did identify systemic failings within the Metropolitan Police, and nine officers are required to improve their standards. A spokesperson said, while we agreed none of the officers involved in these investigations may have breached professional standards justifying disciplinary proceedings, we will be making a number of recommendations to the Metropolitan Police to address some of the systemic failings our investigation identified. We have advised the families of Stephen Port's victims and the officers involved that the performance of nine officers fell below the standard required. They will now be required to improve their performance. A full report and details of our recommendations will be published at the conclusion of all proceedings. The new inquest was meant to be held at the beginning of this year, but now it's said to begin next January in 2021. It's thought that the inquest will also explore the way the police responded to each death, but the full scope of the proceedings is yet to be determined. The inquest jury will examine whether prejudice played a part in how the police initially responded to the deaths and will likely last about eight weeks. 
The families of the four men are suing the Metropolitan Police for more than £200,000, claiming that police failed to link the deaths due to homophobia and discrimination. The High Court action is over breaches of duty and inaction, and accuses the force of breaching the Equality Act of 2010. They also accuse the Met of negligence and misusing or abusing their power by failing to properly investigate. It's going to be very interesting to see the outcome of this inquest. Nobody is accusing the individual officers of outright homophobia, but it's the ingrained systemic prejudices, the subtle discrimination, the pre-perceived ideas of the gay community and the use of drugs. It is finding a gay man overdose on GHB, a drug known for being commonly used by gay men, and just writing off as an overdose without any need for an investigation. Whether a conscious or unconscious bias, there is a bias there. Because as I said at the beginning of this video, you can almost guarantee four straight men being found mysteriously dead close together in a higher class area of London, possibly from a GHB overdose, would definitely grant an investigation. The same would definitely go for four women being found dead. You've got to ask yourself, why didn't the police deem these deaths worthy of an investigation? You better believe I'm going to be following the inquest very, very carefully at the beginning of next year. Maybe if somebody reminds me, if you're watching this after February 2021, I might put a comment down below and just say what came of the inquest, if anything. Thank you so much for watching this video and I'll see you in the next one. Bye guys.